On May 6th of 1915, even before either of the two Fusos hit the water, Japan began its second pair of battleships to complement the four Congo-class battle cruisers. These were the two ships of the 31,260-ton Issei class. Originally only slightly improved Fusos, their design evolved into much more capable ships, though visually similar. Main armament remained the same. Japan still didn't have the capacity to design large guns and their housings. Secondary armament was changed, though. The 6-inch shells of the Fusos and Kongos were a little too heavy for a good sustained rate of firing. They were, after all, about 100 pounds each and had to be hand-loaded. So, a lighter 5.5-inch gun was substituted. As trade-off, more guns were carried and they had a better sustained rate of fire. These guns were the main armament of most light cruisers, so I'll cover its characteristics when I get to them. Though still of the incremental pattern, armor was improved. While still having the same number of coal-fired boilers, horsepower was slightly increased giving them a slightly better speed. The main improvement, though, was in the re rearrangement of the midship turrets. By having the forecastle deck only run to turret 3, it could superfire turret 4, which was a level lower on the main deck. This allowed the two turrets to be much closer together. This, in turn, simplified fire control of the two midship turrets and allowed a rearrangement of the machinery. Most importantly, it helped increase structural strength by having the turret holes closer together. In the 30s, both were heavily modernized. Coal burning gave way to higher pressure oil firing. More powerful turbines were substituted. The pagoda structure was adopted, spotter float planes were added, and the anti-aircraft armament was updated. The most common heavy anti-aircraft gun was the 5-inch 40 caliber Type A9. These were okay guns. Entering service in 1932, they were usually found in twin hydraulically operated 20 to 24 ton mounts. Maximum elevation was 90 degrees and they could theoretically be loaded at any angle. Recoil was 17 and 3 quarter inches which also cocked the spring loaded rammer. Training and elevation speeds were pretty good at 7 and 12 degrees per second respectively. Sustained rate of fire was a respectable, if not impressive, 8 rounds per minute. 250 rounds were usually carried. Maximum range was about 8 miles. With a muzzle velocity of 2,360 feet per second, maximum ceiling was about 30,000 feet. The rounds themselves were about 75.5 pounds with a 4 pound bursting charge and were one piece. Like most heavy anti-aircraft shells, the fuse could be set to detonate after a preset number of seconds in flight, hopefully allowing them to frag their target like a grenade. The only way they really came up short was in lacking radar-guided fire control, like the US's Mark 38, that could adequately track and target the ever faster aircraft they were used against. The most common medium anti-aircraft gun was the 25mm 60 caliber Type 96. Based on a French Hotchkiss design, it entered service in 1936, with production continuing throughout the war. Used by both the Navy and Army, it was found in single, double, and triple barreled mounts. While the Japanese considered it a good medium anti-aircraft gun, in reality, it was totally inadequate in that role. Maximum range was just over 4 miles, which attacking aircraft like the SBD could cover in about, oh, 3 seconds. Sustained rate of fire was about 110 rounds a minute due to the need to switch out the 15 round ammunition clips. With a muzzle velocity of 2,953 feet per second, maximum altitude was realistically just over 9,800 feet meaning it was hard-pressed to even hit most dive bombers until they had already begun their dive. Training and elevation was usually manual, with some triples power-operated. At best, training was about 18 degrees per second and elevation 12 degrees per second. This was inadequate to engage the ever-faster aircraft they were used against. The mounts also suffered from excessive vibration, which made it hard to keep a target locked. 
The sights were also inadequate against ever faster enemy aircraft. They also had a tendency to jam at high angles, like when shooting at dive bombers, which slowed their rate of fire even more. Most grievous, though, was their hitting power. Whereas the U.S.'s 40mm Bofors used a 4 and 3 quarter pound shell, the 25mm was a mere 1.5 pounds. Again, this even as U.S. planes got better armored and more ruggedly built. In effect, these were light anti-aircraft guns the Japanese built as medium ones. The most common light anti-aircraft machine gun was the 13mm 76 caliber. Again, used based on a French Hotchkiss design and essentially a scaled down version of the 25mm, it also entered service in 1936 and production continued right up to the end of the war, being used by both the Navy and Army. Like most light anti-aircraft guns, training and elevation was manual. Maximum range was about 3.5 miles, with a muzzle velocity of 2,641 feet per second Maximum altitude was about 13,000 feet. Rate of fire, while advertised as 470 rounds per minute, was realistically about 250 rounds per minute due to the need to switch out the 2,500 round ammunition clips. Also, like most light anti-aircraft guns, it was almost totally inadequate. Complete shell weight was just over 4 ounces. Compare this with the US's 20 millimeter with a shell weight of eight and a half ounces. Making the problem worse was whereas the 20 millimeter had the advantage of being used against aircraft with virtually no armor, the 13 millimeter had to engage aircraft that were ever increasingly ruggedly built, armored, and faster. In short, it started off lacking the hitting power to be effective and only got relatively worse as the war went on. But Japan's weapons weren't their only problem. Their fleet anti-aircraft tactics were also woefully inadequate. When the fleet came under air attack, doctrine called for the ships to scatter and maneuver independently, usually in a circle. While this did admittedly probably save Hiryu from being destroyed during the 1020 strike at Midway, there can be little doubt that on the whole this scattering only had the effect of dividing anti-aircraft fire at the very moment it needed most to be concentrated. Far more effective was the American doctrine of the force maneuvering as a group, forming layers of protective rings around the carrier. The result was e even when the fleets met with roughly comparable anti-aircraft weapons at the Coral Sea, better fleet anti-aircraft tactics, admittedly helped by radar, meant the Japanese strike aircraft suffered worse at the hands of American anti-aircraft gunners than American strike aircraft did at the hands of the Japanese. I personally find this weakness stunning as the Japanese were the first to practice massed coordinated carrier strike doctrine. How they managed to figure one side out but not the other is beyond me. By the time the Japanese finally did figure out what they were doing wrong, it was way too late. Following the disastrous Battle of Midway, both of these ships underwent a mind-blowing conversion to hybrid battleship carriers the details of which I'll cover later. This raises three important questions. First, why not a full conversion? Second, why these two? Third, what was their intended role? The first, why not a full conversion, is pretty easy to answer. The answer would seem to be a lack of the required materials, labor, and time. Converting them to full deck carriers would have taken nearly as much material, labor, and time as building a new carrier from scratch, and because it would be a conversion, it wouldn't have been nearly as efficient. Consider the carrier Kasagi, which started construction about the same time they began conversion. She ended the war incomplete. It's a pretty tough call to imagine these two could have been fully converted before the end of the war. The second, why these two, hinges on the merits and demerits of these ships and their contemporaries. The two remaining Congos were ruled out due to their lack of armor, and converting them would have meant losing half their armament. This made them unacceptable in light of the intended role. The Fusos were ruled out because they were too slow to operate with the carriers and were structurally weak. The Issei class, on the other hand, was acceptable because their rear turrets had a relatively low elevation. Hyuga was missing one of them anyway.
they were also structurally stronger, faster, and better protected. The Nagatos were ruled out because they were still considered acceptable ships for the battle fleet, and converting them would have meant losing half their armament. The third question, what was their intended role, is the crucial one. Unfortunately, it is also the hardest to answer, partly because it depends on who you ask and even when you ask them. Not helping was the wholesale destruction of wartime documents either by air attack during the war or at the end of the war by the general staff eager to dispose of anything that may be incriminating in the inevitable post-war reckoning. The most likely role, though, seems to be that they were intended to operate ahead of the main carrier fleet, as they did at Cape Engano with the converted Shinano. From there, they could use their aircraft to scout ahead for the enemy. Once battle was joined, their forward position and heavy armor would allow them to absorb the incoming strikes before it reached the main carrier fleet. This in turn would allow the main carrier fleet to launch its attacks on the American carriers unmolested. After the trading of strikes, the forward deployed conversions could close in and use their remaining heavy guns to finish off any wounded American carriers. Again, this is only speculation and others have put forth different roles sometimes even changing their stories as the years went by. Issei was started May 10, 1915 and completed December 15, 1917. Hyuga was started May 6, 1915 and completed April 30, 1918. Main armament was 12 14-inch 45 caliber guns in six twin individually sleeved turrets. Two forward, two midship facing aft, behind the rear funnel with turret 3 over turret 4. The final pair was at the stern. Secondary armament was 20 of the new 5.5 inch 50 caliber guns. 18 were built into casemates at the main deck level as part of the forecastle deck, 9 on each side. The foremost pair was just forward of the barrels of turret 1. The second pair was aside the overhang of turret 1. The third pair was aside the barbette of turret 2. The fourth pair was aside the overhang of turret 2. The fifth pair was aside the vertical pole of the forward tripod. The sixth pair was aside the forward funnel. The seventh and eighth pairs were aside the boats between the two funnels. The ninth pair was aside the rear funnel. The final pair were in open back shielded mounts one deck higher on the forecastle deck between the sixth and seventh pairs aside the forward funnel where the rear legs of the forward tripod met the deck. Finally, six submerged torpedo tubes, three on each side, were fitted. Propulsion was provided by 24 coal-burning boilers between turrets 2 and 3, venting to two funnels that provided steam to the four turbines between turrets 4 and 5. The forward turbine room housed the two that drove the outer shafts. The rear room housed the turbines that drove the inner shafts. These generated 45,000 horsepower to the four propellers for a speed of 23 knots. They had one rudder. Protection remained of the then standard incremental type. The main armored belt stretched from turret 1 to turret 6 and was 12 inches thick just above and below the waterline, thinning to 4 inches as it neared the bottom and 3 inches near the ship's ends. Above the belt armor was the casemate or upper belt, protecting the casemated secondary guns that was 6 inches thick. 12 inch bulkheads formed the ends of the armored box on either end of the belt. Barbette armor was 8 inches thick. Turret armor was 12 inches on the front, 8 inches on the sides, and 4.5 and inches on the roof. Conning tower armor was 13 and 3 quarter inches on the sides, 12 inches on the front, and 4 inches on the roof. Like other ships, the main armored deck wasn't the main deck, but rather the deck that ran perpendicular to where the armored and casemate belts met. This was one and a quarter inches thickening to two inches over the vitals and three inches over the steering gear, with two inches sloping downward at the sides to meet the lower edge of the main belt, effectively acting as a second main belt. The boilers were divided into eight rooms. Finally, they were double bottomed. Modifications were many, as was the case with most interwar battleships. In 1921, 
following World War I, main gun elevation was increased from 20 to 30 degrees, and two single open-mounted 3-inch anti-aircraft guns were added on each side, midship. In 1927, both were fitted with an experimental flying-off platform on turret 2. This didn't last long, though, and it was removed the next year. In the late 20s, the distinctive thumbnail cap was added to the forward funnel to keep smoke out of the ever-increasing number of fire control platforms added to the forward tripod demanded by longer and longer range gunfire. Also, a new flying-off platform was added to the number 5 turret. In the early 30s, as even more levels were added to the superstructure, a crane and catapult were fitted at the stern for spotter float planes while the flying-off platform was removed. Finally, the 3-inch anti-aircraft guns and the deck-mounted 5.5-inch guns were replaced midship with the new 5-inch 40 caliber anti-aircraft gun in four twin mounts, two on each side. After walking out of the League of Nations and abandoning the treaties in the mid-30s, both began their rebuilds. Except for turret 6, which couldn't be for technical reasons, main gun elevation was again increased to 43 degrees. The forward-most casemated 5.5-inch secondaries on either side were removed and the casemates plated over. They were just too wet, while the others had their elevation increased to 30 degrees. Torpedo bulges were added at the expense of removing all of the torpedo tubes to give them a TDS and restore lost buoyancy. The stern was lengthened 25 feet to improve hydrodynamics. More armor was added to the armored deck, bringing it up to two and a quarter inches, with three and three quarter inches over the vitals. Four new turbines capable of 80,000 horsepower replaced the old ones, almost doubling power. All 24 coal-burning boilers were replaced with eight oil-fired ones, each in their own compartment, with a longitudinal bulkhead running down the middle. This allowed the forward funnel to be removed, which in turn allowed the superstructure to be built up to the distinctive Pagoda Tower. Speed increased marginally to 25 knots and displacement rose to 35,800 tons. On May 5th of 1942, while exercising, the left gun in Hyuga's turret 5 breached. Only flooding the magazine saved the ship. Rather than repair the damage, the turret was removed and covered with a plate that had more medium anti-aircraft on it. Later that month, both were fitted with radar, which would be continually upgraded throughout the war. From late February to early October 1943, Issei, made in November 1943 in Hyuga's case, began conversion to a hybrid battleship carrier. Obviously, turrets 5 and 6, or turret 6 and the plate on turret 5 in Hyuga's case, were removed along with the barbettes. As weight compensation, 200 millimeters of concrete were added to the flight deck to keep them from turning down by the bow. Concrete was also added to the steering room in light of the loss of Hiei and Kirishima. The former magazine for turret 5 was converted into weapon storage. The former magazine for turret 6 was converted into fuel storage. All of their 5.5 inch case mated guns were removed which made room for the number of 5-inch 40 caliber anti-aircraft guns to be increased to 16, four twins midship on each side. Of course, the star attraction was the fitting of the 210-foot-long triangular flight deck at the stern, the forward corners of which had catapults for launching aircraft, though unless float planes, they had to land somewhere else. Built into the deck was a system of rails for moving aircraft from the mushroom-shaped elevator at the stern to the catapult. Below the flight deck was a 120 foot long by 18 foot high by 84 foot forward shrinking to 33 foot aft wide hangar. Aircraft complement was projected to be 22 aircraft, but by the time the conversion was completed, neither the airplanes nor the pilots were available. Displacement rose to 38,676 tons. In late September to early October 1944, Six 32-120 mm anti-aircraft rocket launchers were added aft. In November of 1944, with no aircraft to operate, the catapults were removed to reopen the firing arcs of turrets 3 and 4. Both were stationed in Japan as part of the Hashirajima fleet when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor.
being held in reserve for the great decisive battle. While conducting gunnery training on May 5, 1942, Hyuga suffered the aforementioned turret explosion which nearly doomed the ship. From late May to mid-June 1942, they took part in the invasion of the Aleutians and then returned to Japan. The rest of 1942 and the first three quarters of 1943 were spent in Japan, guarding the pier followed by their conversion. In mid-October of 1943, Ise loaded troops and supplies then headed for truck, returning in early November. Almost a year later, in mid-October of 1944, they sailed as part of the Northern Decoy Force during the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Despite numerous air attacks and several submarine attacks, Afterward, as they headed home, neither suffered any serious damage, and they arrived back in Japan at the end of the month. In mid-November, mounting lots of AA while bereft of aircraft, and with the merchant navy mauled by submarines and air attack, they were essentially recast as transports. Loading supplies in their hangars, they headed to the Philippines, but were diverted first to the Spratleys and ultimately to Singapore, arriving near the end of November. Loaded with raw materials in early February of 1945, they left Indochina and despite numerous submarine attacks, arrived safely in, back in Japan near the end of the month, never to leave again. Recast again as floating anti-aircraft platforms for lack of fuel and air cover, they were attacked and hit repeatedly from March 1945 until late July. Hyuga was finally sunk July 25th and Issei July 28th, both in shallow water. Both were scrapped post-war.